Welcome to another episode of Notable Perspectives. I'm your host, Dr. Muthu Alagapan, and today we are joined by Dr. Benjamin Schwartz. Dr. Schwartz is president of Corwell Health East, where he leads strategy and corporate decision making for eight hospitals, 155 outpatient sites, and nearly 5,000 affiliated physicians. Dr. Schwartz is board certified in gynoc as well as OBGYN and has been named a New York top doctor in gynecologic oncology for the past six years. Dr. Schwartz previously served as senior vice president and the physician executive for the Eastern Region of Northwell Health in New York, and also serves as an associate professor at several institutions. Dr. Schwartz, welcome to the show. Hey, great to see you. Thank you for having me. Great. And so I, I always like to, to start from the beginning. Uh, so the beginning of your career, what uh, first got you into healthcare and helped you decide to become a physician? Yeah. So for me, it was very easy. My father was an OBGYN and actually my sister, Sarah, is an OBGYN. So I grew up in a, a house of doctors. Um, uh, I'll admit that in college, I explored other professions just to make sure I didn't want to just follow in my dad's footsteps. But I think uh, for love of my dad who has since passed, um, you know, I, I could see how happy he was in the specialty and in being a physician and how much personal fulfillment he got from his job. And for me, uh, he's always sort of been my mentor and, uh, and everything that I've aspired to be and to see his own personal happiness in his work was something that made it an easy choice for me. That's fantastic. And, and, um, you've, you've practiced medicine. You're now in a leadership position. What was that transition like? Was it conscious, you know, deliberate decision to leave, you know, the practice of medicine and move into this type of a role or, or did it just happen uh, organically? So uh, prior to uh, joining Northwell Health, I was in private practice. And in my private practice, I also took on some administrative leadership roles for Catholic Health Services of Long Island, both as their head of women's health, but also as the chairman of the OBGYN department at one of their hospitals. And when I made the uh, transition over to Northwell Health as an employed physician, um, they, as part of that job, enrolled me in a physician leadership development program. And I have to tell you, it was really um, profound, the impact that that program had on me personally. Um, I learned a lot of things about myself that I'm not so sure I was particularly proud of. And I started to learn the real value of servant leadership. I was one of those surgeons where my space was kind of a command and control space which to me uh, made sense at the time. But as I started to take on more and more responsibilities at Northwell, it became more clear to me personally that I needed to grow to be a more successful leader. And actually, right after finishing that program, I did a master's in healthcare management at uh, the Harvard School of Public Health, which was kind of a physician leadership development program on steroids. I can't say that I'm a perfect leader. It's, it's always a work in progress, but I think those two programs really were pivotal in me defining what I wanted to do with my life, how I could be the most impactful, and really was the trigger that started to steer me away from a very busy, busy clinical practice and closer to an administrative leadership role. Do you miss practicing medicine in your day-to-day -day job? And, and if so, how do you... Uh... How have you dealt with that, that transition out of that? So it's really fascinating. I uh, started this job in July of this year. And my last uh, week uh, while in New York, I did surgeries on my surgery day. And I saw uh, many, many patients on my last day in the office. And then all of a sudden, I was 100% administrative and living in Michigan. And many people have asked me, particularly our physicians here, if I miss it. And the truth is that I miss the patients. I miss the relationships with them. I miss the relationships with my colleagues, both in and outside of the office. But, you know, my new role here is something I'm particularly proud of. It's something I'm thoroughly enjoying. And I don't think you could do this job effectively and also carry the burden of worrying about patient care. Um, I've 
done thousands of hysterectomies over the years. I think I sort of felt like I had done most of the things I wanted to accomplish in an operating room and that it was time and that I was ready to move on to the next thing. So as much as it may surprise uh, your audience, actually, I don't miss it that much at all, except for the relationships. And I'm excited about this new chapter. Great. And and so you were named president of Corwell Health East in in June of this year. Uh, Most people are familiar with what it's like to transition jobs, but transitioning health systems, especially at this level, is a a very different uh, experience. What was that transition like, leaving Northwell and joining Corwell? Well, for starters, I have to say um, how appreciative I am to Northwell Health. I think they really committed a lot of energy and resources into my own personal professional development. I think it's a great place for people to work. And, you know, even though it was a bit melancholy to be leaving there, I so appreciated that they were kind and generous about giving me advice and helping to make that transition go as smoothly as possible. So for that, I'll be forever grateful to them. Um, For moving here and starting here, I think the hardest challenge Uh, was not the move because uh, for those of your listeners that are in the Midwest, I think it will resonate with them that Midwesterners and Michiganders are incredibly nice people and kind and uh, healthcare is a big deal in Southeast Michigan. And so to be the president of this part of the system, I think um, gave me a little bit of quick instant celebrity here, even something I'm not really used to. And so everybody really went out of their way to, um, in a very generous way, help to my family to make the transition, help to get my son into school, gave us great advice on where to live. That part, I think, was really easy. I think the, the biggest challenge for me personally is that as I ascended through uh, Northwell on Long Island, With each change in position, I was still a known person to everyone at Northwell. And as someone who grew up on Long Island and spent my whole life there, I never had to reestablish myself with strangers. It was always with people that knew me. And walking into this new role, not only am I a bit of an outsider from another state, from another system, but I'm also someone with no track record or history here. So relationships has been top of mind and the number one priority, you know. Uh, Luckily, Midwesterners, Michiganders are kind and trusting people. But, um, you know, our health system here has gone through a very tumultuous last few years, like many through the pandemic. And healthcare has some legitimate challenges now. And our teams are kind of, you know, still feeling the pressures of what the pandemic left. And so as kind and as generous as they've been, they also, you know, they, they want to understand better who I am. And this is all happening at the same time that a large integration is happening between what was once called Beaumont Health, where I am, and Spectrum Health on the west side of the state into the larger Corwell Health system, including Lakeland and Priority Health, our insurance carrier. And that also is causing a little bit of an identity crisis because we have a new logo, a new name, a new leader. It's just a lot all at once. Uh, I've been here for five months. I feel like things, the newness is sort of settling in and and people were starting to develop a rhythm. Uh, But I think those were sort of the hardest challenges. I was going out in the first couple of months. Luckily, my family didn't come out right away. I was going out to dinner sometimes twice a day. Uh, just to have a chance to meet as many people as I could. And I think it's paying off dividends now because those relationships are starting to really blossom. And and so you get into this new system, you're the president now. Um, you know, what are your kind of five-year goals for the system? Where do you want to see Corwell, you know, Health East get to in three to five years uh, that you've, you know, you're sort of energizing the, the base around? I mean, I think our aspirations are probably very similar to just about any healthcare system. You know, we want to be one of the greatest places for people to go to get care. That means a great patient experience. It means extremely talented providers, both physicians and nurses. It means 
doing the things that matter for patients to really um, feel like we're easy to navigate, we're easy to access, that we're providing the right care in the right places for the right price, and that we're focusing on making healthcare um, equitable and addressing social determinants of health. You know, our new name Corewell speaks volumes to our priorities, which is that in our core, we want our communities to be more well. And I think that's a number one priority. Number two, we want to be a really terrific place for people to work to provide that care. We want to be a great employer. We want to get to a place, and I think this is where technology really represents a great opportunity. We want to be a place where it's easier to provide care or that providers can do the value-added work that they train to do and lessen some of the administrative burdens that providers are faced with now. We want to be a place that has diversity and makes diversity and equity and inclusion a priority. Um, because honestly, if we're going to address social determinants of health and health equity, then we need a provider team that's equally as diverse as the communities that we're taking care of. And I think we really want to be a place that focuses on wellness, not just of our physicians, but of all of our team members who have gone through a tremendous ordeal over the last few years. And I think our last priority is that we want to be one of the very best places to train the next generation. We want to have the educational programs, both uh, in collaborations with medical and nursing schools and trade schools. We want to have tremendous residency and fellowship training programs. In Corwell Health East, we have a thousand trainees. Um, it's a very large program. We have thousands, literally close to 6,000 nursing students rotating through our buildings. Um, and uh, we have terrific relationships with medical schools in, the, in our market. By all accounts, the way healthcare is provided in the future is going to have to change a lot, leveraging technology, because every projection shows that we won't have, we don't have enough trainees right now to meet the needs of society in the future. And so we have to be able to be innovative about the way that we provide care. And I think that's also a big part of our educational programs. And I think, you know, to have the very best faculty, we have to be a center of excellence, not just for our clinical programs, but also for research um, in all spaces, technology, innovation, but also in population health. And we're making those our major priorities. I'm so glad you mentioned uh, making it a terrific place to work. So often when I ask that question, we hear all about you know, the great ways we're going to improve the patient experience and often, uh, you know, neglect the staff experience. So I'm really kind of glad you mentioned that. And I'd love to ask you more about creating a culture uh, in a provider organization that's conducive to that. We had Dr. Toby Cosgrove of the Cleveland Clinic on, and he mentioned how at the Cleveland Clinic, uh, where I know you spent some years training, um, everyone is called a caregiver, whether you're, uh, you know, you know, driving a, a transportation shuttle or cleaning up the operating room or doing the surgery. Um, are there examples of that type of uh, uh, culture building at Corwell that inspire you or that you're hoping to bring to the system to improve the culture? Yeah, thank you for the question. It almost harkens back to a certain amusement park where everyone's called a cast member um, because, you know, it's it's all about the uh, consumer's experience and, 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 and are obviously in the entertainment field. We're obviously in the providing care field. I think it's very similar. The most satisfying part of this job, the job that I have now, is the opportunity to uh, build a wonderful culture. We are doing a lot of work at Corwell Health, particularly as we bring multiple successful systems together, including an insurance plan, in defining what our culture is and who we are. And we're focusing a lot on um, not just what our mission and vision and values are, which I think is obviously critically important to defining who you are and what our aspirations are, but we're also looking at relationships and being in the moment when you're talking to someone and Looking at our differences, because we're the largest employer in the state of Michigan, we cover a large geographical footprint, there are differences in the communities that Corwell Health um, takes care of and where our team members come from. 
and having a sort of curious, positive uh, mind where you assume positive intent when you hear something that sounds different to you and being accountable, empowering our team members to be innovative, allowing them to make mistakes when those things happen and learning from those mistakes, I think are important priorities. You know, there's been a lot of talk about staffing challenges that we have and the other issues that we have. And usually those conversations lean very heavily into money and compensation and finance. And I, and that, of course, is really important. But what's equally as important is creating a work environment where people can feel like they're masters of what they do, that they're respected, that they have autonomy, that they're not being managed, and that they're supported by servant leaders that are doing everything they can to make them successful. It's work. It's not a thing you do in, an, in, in a one-day session. It's, it's an everyday cadence where it becomes a part of your regular routine. But I can tell you with the work that we've done in just a few months here, our system really was integrated in February. So it's been about nine, 10 months. Um, just in the last few months of focusing on culture and, and the work that we've done has really had a magical impact on our team members and how they feel about their work, how they feel about all of the changes that we're navigating through. And has really, I think, really been a catalyst for ch for change navigation. It's made it much, much easier uh, for us to navigate through the challenges that we have in healthcare, but also through the changes of becoming a larger system. I, I uh, remember hearing once that I believe UT Southwestern, instead of just phones in the provider workrooms, they actually have video screens attached to the phones because they found that people are nicer to each other when they're on video than when they're just talking to each other on the phone. And as you know, Providers, you know, consultants, et cetera, you know, conversations can get heated sometimes. Uh, and, and it was just a striking example of how environment can um, kind of uh, affect how we behave and how designing environments in a thoughtful way can, can really improve culture and make people feel respected and, and, and things like that. Yeah, I think it's wonderful that, you know, um, I think there are skeptics about technology that feel like technology has had um, an impact that may not be so desirable on us as human beings. You know, you see these artists that that paint paintings of people staring at their phones and or lying in bed next to each other and not speaking to one another. But actually, you know, when you call out this video thing, the technology addressed a void that existed in how we communicate with one another, and it met the needs of human beings to have better interactions. And by being able to do that in real time, just the way you and I are looking at each other right now, has seriously positively impacted our ability to have communications and relate and has made us incredibly efficient. You know, I, I can't even imagine. I remember my, my little guys having a birthday party this weekend and my wife reminded me that there was a time when we used to have to put little cards in the invitations with directions mm -hmm. and people would get lost on the way now. That seems completely absurd. Technology has made it that much easier. And I see in every space in healthcare a shift away from providers being forced to accommodate technology to technology addressing providers' needs. And I think it's really wonderful. That's terrific. And, and I think we continue to be very optimistic about technology's ability to, to bring people together, to improve culture, to improve the experience. And so exciting to hear that. Um, I, I'd love to shift gears a, a little bit and, and talk more about the recent merger that you, you alluded to in February of this year with Beaumont Health and Spectrum Health uh, joining together. Mergers and consolidation are happening across the country from the patient perspective, is this something patients should welcome? And does this ultimately affect patients either positively or negatively when large health systems come together, in your opinion? So I think the short answer is that it depends. Um, I think it in part depends on why the systems are coming together. Um, you know, my own personal experience, whether it's at Northwell Health or now at Corwell Health, has been that the impact of integration has been incredibly positive. And I think patients can expect that these the, the integration, so for example, um, 
our footprint as a health system in Michigan covers from the west side of the state to the east side of the state. And as we talk about integrating our systems, we will land at a place where no matter what hospital of ours you walk into or doctor's office of ours that you walk into, your records will be easily accessible and will be there. And, you know, in some instances to go from one side of the state to the other could be a three or four hour drive. And it will be as if you're right next door. Um, I think as we focus on um, the opportunities that our size presents, there's a real opportunity to get towards value-based care models and for us to focus less on how many joint replacements can we do to how many joint replacements can we avoid because we're keeping people healthier. And our size allows us to look at an ambulatory strategy, a primary care strategy that will bring healthcare closer to people's homes, make it easier for them to access, and for them to have access to very high quality, high value care without having to drive great distances to find it. And so I think both in New York, where I came from, and here in Michigan, having a large health system like the one we have here at Corwell Health is an incredible opportunity for patients to um, have less obstacles to getting the care that they need. And for us to, because we've consolidated and we're integrated, we're able to find significant operational cost savings, which I think ultimately uh, the patients will enjoy in how much their healthcare costs. In, in the case of this merger, I believe both Beaumont and Spectrum were on Epic uh, before the merger. And so I imagine integrating those is uh, a, a little easier than if you came from two different EMRs. How much of a consideration is that, do you think, during a, a big consolidation or merger in making sure that the EMRs are the same? Because I imagine that facilitates the record sharing and everything else that's going on. Yeah, thank you. You know, so actually we have several instances of Epic. Uh, just in the legacy Beaumont system, we have two different versions of Epic. And they're actually more dissimilar than they are similar. Um, the good news is that at Spectrum, they had a highly rated newest version of Epic that really offers tremendous opportunity for us here. I think there has been a bit of a disconnect just within Corwell Health East because of the two different instances of Epic. And we're about to go through landing at the, at the Spectrum version, the newer version, which has all the newest bells and whistles across the entire system. I think it's a lot easier, though. And I'm sure our, tech, our digital services technical folks would agree completely. It's a lot easier to go from an Epic infrastructure to a newer Epic infrastructure than to go from something else to Epic. I think the disruptions that changing uh, an EMR can bring can be very significant, not just in the flow of patient information, but also on revenue cycle and quality programs and everything else. Um, we have a very aggressive timeline for going through this integration and to land on one EMR. It will be a significant disruption as we do it, but where we're going to land is going to be spectacular. It will allow us to identify best practices. It will allow us to implement more value-based care. It will allow us to implement more evidence-based clinical algorithms. It will allow us to create a better um, digital patient experience. And it will certainly allow, when we want to do innovations, Whereas right now, we'd have to do the innovation in several different versions, whether it's robot-based or API-based. Um, having Being on one version really allows us to grow and keep up with the pace of technical innovation in a much easier way. Are there areas that you, in your role right now, would want to look outside of the EMR when it comes to filling a need, solving a problem, you know, uh, developing you know, an innovative strategy? Where do you choose to look to the EMR and, and where do you choose to look outside? So this is, a, I think this is a, a really insightful question. And I think my experience with health systems is that I don't think anybody really knows the answer yet because 
there's this challenge, which is number one, can we build everything ourselves? I think there was a time where maybe that was more possible, but with the, the speed that innovation is growing and all the new technologies that are out there, probably health systems are the least qualified to try to be in that space. And so then the challenge, and, and by the way, I'm not so sure everyone in healthcare agrees with me on that, but that's my own personal take. And, you know, I've, I've kind of been in, been in this space a lot over the last 20 years. And it really depends on who you talk to for this answer. I do believe that there's a strong opportunity for us to partner with um, what I would call a third-party vendor outside of the EMR developer to look at solutions that are either integrated with the EMR, use the EMR, or could be totally separate from the EMR. Um, I think one of the challenges that we have uh, is that it's kind of like when you go on the app store, there's so many people out there trying to get into this space. And I think the biggest challenge that we have, and I don't think it was dissimilar at Northwell either, is that we're just so big that a disruption that doesn't work could have very significant consequences, that it's an absolute priority for us to use very careful and very conservative vetting of the technology, that it works, that it actually is gonna provide a service that it promises to, and that the impact is going to be as great as some companies love to preach that they will be. Um, and so I think what's a little frustrating in healthcare, and of course, cybersecurity is top of mind for us, we're handling information that's extremely private. And um, several very large health systems with very sophisticated cybersecurity systems have been victims of attacks. And so I think what happens for fear of letting people inside our firewalls is what ends up happening is, unlike most industries, we move incredibly slowly in this space. We're very risk averse. And it can sometimes take a very long time to implement new technologies. But I can only tell you that when I travel on an airline, the app that I'm using is so much more sophisticated than what we have. And it's, so, it's such a wonderful user experience. If I want to order delivery food to my house, it's such a wonderful experience. Healthcare is beyond the fact that healthcare obviously is much more complex than delivering Chinese food. Um, the reality is, is that culturally, we just move a lot slower. We were talking about, you know, mergers and, and the system getting bigger and the advantages that has, you know, one of the disadvantages is likely that it becomes harder to make decisions the bigger you are, um, of course. Um, and it's also hard to make decisions because there's too many options, like you, you mentioned, you know, so many uh, different companies and ideas that are vying for your attention I would love to hear how either at Northwell or now at Corwell, you think about the process of, of bringing teams together to make a decision on whether to work with a vendor or not. How, you know, how do you mobilize a, 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 an organization that big to make a decision and to kind of move through the process of impl implementing a new technology? Yeah, so I, I think you've called out a, 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 a significant challenge in large healthcare systems that are, by design, generally speaking, a complex matrix where there's a lot of stakeholders in every decision. There's real value, excuse me, there's real value to that. There are instances where it's very important to hear the perspectives from multiple, from multiple perspectives of, of a decision that has to be made before making a final decision. And, um, and I think health systems in particular value their complexity and don't necessarily see it as a bureaucratic hindrance. You know, whether it's some new surgical device or some new medication or some new care delivery model, we tend to spend a lot of time vetting those things before we just try them out out of impulse. Um, having said that, I think there's a growing science in healthcare information systems 
And I think the most robust health systems have expertise within them that are strong voices in the decision-making process. And they, generally speaking, become a bit of the gatekeeper. They kind of squelch out some of the noise and really highlight the high value opportunities for a health system. I think what would be very helpful though, and it's something that I think, you know, is in development in a lot of, lot of large health systems, is creating spaces, sandboxes, if you will, where innovations can basically show and demonstrate what they can do without having to go through the rigor of gaining security access and other things. Uh, I've had a few vendors, uh, American companies, that I thought were really innovative and exciting. But because part of their infrastructure may have service technicians overseas or, not, or, um, or without certain level of security, a health system just wouldn't allow us to even talk to them because of the concern around cybersecurity. And so it would be really nice to not have to exclude everyone based on that by having some sort of a freestanding, not at all connected to our systems, mock version of our EMR where people could really show what works and what doesn't work. Because that is sort of the challenge. And then the other issue that I think is complicated is that Generally speaking, most third-party companies see large health systems as the big fish that they want to go after, and they haven't really caught any smaller fish yet. And so, you know, we worry, I think, that the type, the level of service that we're going to need, I mean, we have at Corwell Health, we have over 60,000 employees. Um, At Northwell, we were close to 90,000 employees. So can a small company with, with great aspirations, with a great product, deliver the level of service that we would need on a day-to-day basis? And sometimes I, you know, I've, I've, I've advised companies, why don't you show that you can do this at a smaller health system and figure out what your scale is and then come to us after that? And I think there is something to that, that we tend to look at startups with skepticism that they just don't know exactly how big of a bite they're taking when they want to engage a system as large as ours. Yeah, I love the idea of, of a uh, almost uh, uncoupled or disconnected uh, sandbox where you can, you can um, you know, try and prove value. Uh, do you think that can happen? Do you think that sandbox can be shared amongst many health systems instead of having each health system have their own version of that? Could could there be almost a shared demonstration environment that a company you know, shows value in that many health systems sort of look at to get signal on, does this work or not? Or do you think each health system is unique enough where that, that needs to exist in, in collaboration with the health system? You know, I kind of think it depends on what it is. Um, and I think it kind of depends on where the health system is, what their market is, what their expertise is in. Um, you know, I think generally speaking, um, how different could, if we're on the exact same version of an EMR as somewhere else, how different could that really be? Would they really have to repeat testing over and over again to show that it works? I think that seems awfully wasteful. And probably by the time you set it all up, they're already on to the next version anyway. And then they hadn't done the newer version on the old place anyway. So I think there could be really great value, or maybe even, you know, I I don't know a lot about how EMR companies function, but I I get the sense that they're pretty proprietary about, you know, not allowing third-party companies to develop things that work with their systems. They'd rather build them on their own. But it would be kind of nice if we had some sort of like a seal of approval that an EMR company could say, this platform has been is bug free and and works and can be demoed on this version of this EMR and we've given it the seal of approval that it's that it's not going to crash your system if you want to experiment with it. Yeah, that makes sense and and kind of going off of that I'm curious how do large health systems 
educate themselves on the merits of a particular vendor today. You know, if I'm if I'm buying shoes, for example, I can try it on, I can read reviews. I mean, I've got a process for knowing, you know, how to vet, you know, one shoe versus the other. How, how do you do that at a health system? Are you talking to peer health systems? Are you looking at industry uh, uh, organizations like class? Yeah, how does it work? I mean, it's a lot easier than picking a pair of shoes. <laughs> Um, no, I, I think all of the above. I think, you know, the, the, the companies, first of all, they're very effective at sharing what their innovation is and, 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 and they find ways to reach out to us and to connect with us. I think the internet has been a magical um, and, and has had a profound impact on health system leaders being able to communicate with one another and share experiences and you know we never consider anything without asking where else have you done it and we and we would never do anything without calling them and i think you know the the, the really wonderful thing about healthcare is that it is an altruistic industry we all are here trying to make patient care better and so i think we're kind and generous generally speaking with each other and sharing our experiences it's not like it's some sort of crazy top secret thing that we don't want to tell anyone else about and it's it's pretty hard to uh to come up with some innovation and not have people that will have opinions for and against um i think what gives local leadership value is that every market is different every environment is different every care model is different um it's not cookie cutter and and each place has its own niche specialties that that they highlight and others that they don't and so you know the leadership of a health system has to make a value judgment um so for example if uh we're considering a technology and it's been used in a hospital that only does cancer care for example how much of that experience at the cancer hospital uh relates to what the experience might be in one of our heart centers or on one of our labor and delivery units where the care is different. And, um, you know, it's, it's, it's very difficult, I think, for companies to be able to say, we made this work at a system that's exactly like yours because there are no two health systems that are exactly alike. So I think we've got time for, for one more question. And I want to I ask you about automation, which we, we think a lot about at, at Notable. You, know, you mentioned at Corewell, you've got 60,000 employees at Northwell, you know, close to 90,000. I'm sure if, if you had the option, you'd love 10,000 more to, to, to be doing all types of you know, uh, value-based care and other work to make the patient experience better. Uh, but that's hard for health systems these days, you know, finding, f- finding you know, uh, staff and, and, and being able to hire them. Uh, you know, what are your thoughts on automation uh, and automation's role uh, in the future of healthcare? At Notable, of course, we have a lot of excitement about automation and digital workforces helping to offset some of the administrative burden that that we've found ourselves in. Um, do you share that same level of enthusiasm? And do you think automation is going to become more mainstream in healthcare in the next five to 10 years? Yeah, I'm very excited about this space. Uh, you know, I'm a robotic surgeon. Uh, And I remember when the robots first came out, there was a real reluctance on the part of patients that that surgical robots were somehow like robots on the production line in an automobile factory and that the doctor wouldn't even be paying attention and the robot would do the operation. And as, as robots became more popular and people started to understand exactly what their role is and that it's not that, I can tell you that for me personally, um, as a, as a surgeon, Automation made the operations easier and more efficient and um, with really wonderful patient outcomes. And I think when you look at every process of a patient's experience, whether it's seeing their primary care doctor in an office or going for a screening mammogram or going to an emergency center or an urgent care center or going for an elective operation or ending up in the intensive care unit, in the space where we're at, where providers are frequently tasked to do a lot of administrative workload, any opportunity where automation can allow the provider to really focus on taking care of the patient and giving the patient the attention that they deserve and being in the moment and not being distracted by all the other things that go along, 
will not only create a better patient experience in terms of just their interactions with their providers, but also will allow the providers to provide better high quality care. And so, you know, when we talk about value added, most people did not go to medical school with a burning desire to be typing in an EMR for several hours a day. Most people went to medical school to sit and look patients in the eyes and have conversations with them and to take care of them. And automation has come a very long way. I am super excited to see what companies like yours come up with over the next five to 10 years. Um, Will there always need to be that human connection? Of course. Can I imagine, I don't know, maybe it's naive, but can I imagine a time where I go to a doctor's office and a robot walks in and says, nice to meet you. Let me listen to your heart. Uh, I don't, maybe, maybe I'm predicting the future, but I, I still feel like there's that human doctor patient relationship or provider patient relationship that's crucial. But I would love for technology to allow the providers to be more in the moment and be less distracted by typing and billing and all the things that really none of us went to medical school to do. Well, that's a great, great note to end on. Dr. Schwartz, thank you for joining us. Really enjoyed having you on the podcast. I so appreciate you inviting me. Thank you so much.